that holds the burgeoning intersectionalist progressive Islamist alliance together of the Jeremy Corbynites of a variety across the pond and the Sanders Omar variety here at home. It is what allows our woke progressives to try to justify the kind of Holocaust inversion where Jews today, including the leader of Israel, are labeled white supremacists because they're cast as sitting atop the privileged pyramid that the left embraces, rendering Jews obviously persecuted throughout our history, the ultimate victimizers, rather than the ultimate victims. And there are historical roots to this, as I chronicle in the book. Jew hatred, of course, was an essential part of socialism from its earliest development in the 19th century, and has predominated in the Islamic world, as ZOA has highlighted at great length, since the advent of the religion. It continued as this alliance between the international left and the Islamic supremacist world coalesced during the Cold War, and it manifests itself today in the person of Ilhan Omar and her acolytes. And as I argue in the book, Ilhan Omar sits at the center of this intersectional alliance and is one of, if not its key leaders. She's the ideological heir, as I detail, of not just her self-described heroes, like an Angela Davis, for example, who, by the way, sided with the communists, was a communist, and including not passing along requests to allow Jews to be able to leave the Soviet Union, but the likes of Edward Said, Yasser Arafat and their comrades. You see it in the rhetoric, you see it in the policy positions she takes, and you see it in the company that she keeps as well. Though the original sin for the Democrats, in my view, with respect to Omar and the ideology she represents, may have been Nancy Pelosi's putting Omar on the House Foreign Affairs Committee to curry favor with the party's progressives. The red line moment was the party's unwillingness to censure Ilhan Omar over her anti-Semitic remarks concerning the dual loyalty canard and the so-called Israel lobby. And ironically, let me point out on this latter point that while Ilhan Omar was talking about APAC in her odious comments, as I note in the book, it was J Street, an organization that Ilhan Omar has supported that contributed more money than any other Israel-focused group during the 2018 midterm election cycle. 98% of its campaign funds went to the Congresswoman's fellow Democrats. Let me also point out, and I spend a full chapter on this in the book, that Barack Obama is sort of the forgotten man in this story. He paved the way for Ilhan Omar, yet he's not gotten his due. And you can trace in Obama the legitimization of both radical leftism and the Islamic supremacists with who they make common cause, and the shift in the Overton window of positions in the Democratic Party, and really in America generally, on both Jews and Israel, that enabled Ilhan Omar to become a viable national figure. Let me also point out in the book, I present an argument I think many of you will find compelling that Democrats are effectively trading <coughs> Jewish votes for Muslim votes. And there are a variety of reasons for this and perhaps we can talk about them uh, after I conclude these remarks. Uh, incidentally, let me also highlight that the most visible manifestations of Jew hatred in this country today concern attacks on Orthodox Jews the only politically conservative by the American definition, sect of Jews, and they are primarily, of course, located in deep lo blue locales, or those attacks are perpetrated by those from deep blue locales, as the recent attack and death now of Joseph Neumann attests to. So I ask the question, can we separate the atmosphere in which these crimes are committed from the rise of this progressive Islamist alliance? Mm. Setting all of this aside, it's bad enough that a party has embraced an Ilhan Omar who passes Natan Sharansky's 3D test for anti-Semitism with flying colors, which goes beyond just her rhetoric or her embrace of the jihad tied genocidal BDS movement. And by the way, how can you support a group that wants to destroy the Jewish state and say you don't hate Jews? Uh, but also who seems determined to act out every example of anti-Semitism as laid out by our State Department. It becomes a literal danger to American life and limb, however, when one considers that Omar supports the policies of, takes money from, and consorts with Jew-hating, Islamist, terror-tied entities, foreign and domestic, that seek to undermine America, Israel, and all of our allies and partners. And this brings me to my final point, which is that Ilhan Omar's radical views, her poisonous rhetoric, and her corruption, both in terms of unethical and almost certainly criminal behavior, masks the fact that she literally poses a national security threat to the American people. And that security threat concerns her collusion with adversaries, foreign and domestic. 
on the foreign side, in the book, I apply the Robert Mueller special mandate, special counsel mandate, rather, to find extensive links, ties, and or coordination, primarily between Omar and Erdogan's regime in Turkey and the Somali regime under Farmaggio. But of course, there are implications to these relationships that go beyond either of those two countries, which really position Ilhan Omar in the Islamic supremacist alliance, both Sunni and Shia, led by Iran, Turkey, Qatar, and others, as opposed to the American alliance with Israel and partnership with several of the Sunni Arab states that themselves face threats from these other Islamic supremacist groups. Omar always sides with the Islamic supremacist side, as I detail at great length in the book. On the domestic side, we see this collusion most prominently in Omar speaking in front of, supporting the policies of, and rece receiving remuneration and campaign contributions from the likes of CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, unindicted co-conspirator in the then largest terrorist financing case in US history, and a number of other Muslim Brotherhood linked organizations and individuals in America and abroad that put America last and Islamists first. On account of her allegedly criminal personal behavior and verifiable ethical lapses and corruption alone, Omar, were she a mere mortal, would never be able to get the most basic of security clearances. Throw in this collusion with foreign adversaries and domestic ones as well, and it is absolutely chilling to consider the threat to our national security of Ilhan Omar sitting on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, privy to our most sensitive information and intelligence. In closing, I, I wrote this book because a country cannot long survive when a party representing roughly half of the public is consumed by an ethos of national self-loathing. The truth about Ilhan Omar must be brought to light if we're to have any chance of preventing tomorrow there being 10 or 20 or 50 Omars in Congress. It's an existential threat to the entire Judeo-Christian West. That as I show in discussing the unexplored roots of Omar's ideology and agenda in the book, that her worldview could have just as easily been picked up in the Marxist Islamist dystopia in which she grew up, privileged in Mogadishu, as in her adopted home in Minneapolis, should terrify every American. I also wrote this book to expose the nature of the progressive political adversary and provide arguments to refute them. So there's a practical value to it, covering matters from the literal and figu figurative perpetual assault on Israel, from the classroom to the courtroom and the battlefield, to the matter of free speech. And on this last point about free speech, I wrote this book to put forth the argument and hopefully encourage others to follow suit that it is absolutely imperative that we speak openly, honestly, and boldly without hysterics, but with strength about the threat posed by Ilhan Omar and her like-minded acolytes. They like to raise the argument of Islamophobia to try and shut down any and all dissenting opinion. And in fact, within days after I released this book, even though her campaign naturally and her team never responded to my inquiries in connection with the book, her campaign team put out a fundraising email saying that by writing this book, I was trying to incite violence against her. So what was the point of all that? Again, to raise the argument of Islamophobia to try and shut down any and all dissenting opinion. The chilling of free speech represents the attempt to impose incidentally de facto Sharia speech codes on us all. But whether or not they're grounded in Sharia or just leftist concepts of hate speech, which really have no basis in the West, the fact of the matter is that it would be Islamophobic not to subject Ilhan Omar and her sisters like Linda Sarsour and Rashida Tlaib to the very same level of scrutiny as we do all public figures. Ironically, the people speaking out against Ilhan Omar in her district, in particular over her allegedly criminal personal behavior, which I devote a chapter to in the book, are actually Somali American Muslims. So are they all Islamophobic bigots too? But more importantly, those forming this progressive Islamist alliance seek to use victimhood and claims of bigotry to silence and stifle us, and as a shield to protect themselves from competition in this vital war of ideas. We have to hold on to our concept of the First Amendment with all our strength and exercise it liberally, because once we lose that right, we lose all of our other rights too. The tyrannical cryboys cannot abide free speech. We must speak ever more freely for liberty, the great exception throughout the history of mankind in general, and among Jews specifically, 
if we hope to triumph over this generation's battle with tyranny at home and abroad. I greatly appreciate your sharing your time to hear a bit about my book, American Ingrate, which I hope will serve as a companion for you during this time of self-quarantining, social distancing, and hopefully reflection. And to all of you who are watching at home, again, Chag Sameach, and I want to wish you and your families health and happiness during these trying times. I hope you'll pick up this book if you're compelled by these remarks today, share it with your children and grandchildren and friends because it concerns every American and really everyone in the West. So thank you, and I look forward to taking some questions and continuing the conversation now.